This is the Power to Podcast, show 155. Well, I try to personalize it and have them recall the environments that where they thrive and where they, and it's almost always I feel cared for, I feel safe, I feel loved, I feel challenged. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's how we know if we're doing our job each day. Do our kids feel successful? Do they feel challenged? Do they feel loved? If we've got all three of those things, I just can't imagine how we could possibly do it any better with the hours in front of our students. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ken Erman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I am here without my co-host, Mr. Matt, the Merry Man Rogers. We are approaching the coveted winter break, even though this will come out uh, after it is over. So use this time to reflect and remember how much you enjoyed that that winter break around the new year and use that to help you continue to power through into into the new year. I had an amazing conversation with with who is now a friend of mine. Uh, We met a little bit over a year ago at a conference. She works locally, and her name is Suzanne Daly. We had just a fantastic conversation. She is a great educator. She's a great instructional coach. She's a podcast host. She's she's an author. She is a uh, well-rounded, well-equipped, very professional, and very personable educator that really can help and impact any teacher out there. The teachers in her district are lucky enough to have her in their, her classroom as often as she can be, supporting them, modeling teaching, observing teaching. We talk a lot about a lot tonight. Um, I would say a big focus of it is positive psychology. And as Suzanne even referenced a guest we had on uh, a few episodes ago, Grace Stevens, where I talked about positive psychology with her and Suzanne, uh, she takes it into a different direction with some, with some different ideas and things to think about. Uh, Positive psychology is something that I am rooting myself in more and more and realizing how much of an impact it can have on my ability as a coach, as an educator, as a husband, as a father. And it's something that I I think we all need to take great consideration in. It's something that really can help us be the best versions of ourselves and give the best version of ourselves to the people we interact with on a daily basis. Suzanne talks about how draining education can be, and it can be, but it can be so empowering and rewarding at the same time. So I really don't want to delay this any further. She has all the the amazing insight and ideas and, and things for us to think about. So let's hear from Teach Better and jump right into that conversation with Suzanne Daly. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Suzanne. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing tonight? Hi, Ken. It's so good to be here on the other side. I'm usually a listener. Uh, I know. I, I'm excited to have you. Uh, I'm sure it'll come out throughout the conversation, but Suzanne and I are friends. We do know each other through teaching, from teaching, um, and, and we've gotten to know each other a lot over the last, really over the last year, even though we've been in common circles for, for a long time. So please officially introduce yourself, let our audience know where you are coming from, and give us a snapshot of your career in education. So I'm just one district away from Ken. I am in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, in the Central Bucks School District. So I work in about 15 elementary schools. So that works out to be about 600 colleagues and about 9,000 students where I'm an instructional coach. So I get to teach model lessons. I get to do workshops and connect colleagues from all over the district. So I've been doing this work for about 12 years. And prior to that, I was a fourth grade teacher and a reading specialist. All right. So I want to learn about Mrs. Daly, the fourth grade teacher. What was your, (laughs) what was your classroom like? And how would the teacher next door or across the hall describe your classroom and, and just the, the dynamic that, 
they may have heard, seen, or uh, or saw you know saw at a passing glance. It's funny, Ken, because now I'm going to weddings and baby showers of my former fourth grade students, and so hearing what they remember is really wonderful. They remember. I would greet them at the door every day. Mm -hmm. It almost became like a superstition. I'm like, the days I don't meet them at the door, the wheels fall off. Right? Mm -hmm. So they know that I, I would greet them at the door. I check in on them. We worked hard. I mean, the expectation was if you're a daily, you come correct. And your job, job one is school. So you come, we get good work done, but then we also play hard and we love hard. And they remember we were in a portable classroom for a few years. So they remember being outside and we kind of felt like our one room schoolhouse out there. But we had, we worked really, really hard if you were a daily. Um, but like I said, we had a really good time and nurtured those relationships with each other. And, you know, across different grade levels at one time when I first started, at Mill Creek Elementary School, there were eight sections of fourth grade just in our school. So it felt really, really big because it was, but I worked really hard to try and make it feel as small and community-based as possible. And now for the first time, one of my former students, Julia, was in t new teacher induction. So now she's teaching fourth grade, That's not awesome. at Mill Creek, a different school. So it's all coming full circle, which is wonderful. That's so cool. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the reasons you and I get along because we are so similar in so many different ways, especially professionally. And when I would start the year with my fifth graders, especially when I had been at Siler for an extended period of time and they, they knew who I was, they saw me running the assemblies and, and being very, uh, you know, very involved in the school community. And I told the students, you probably think I'm the fun fifth grade teacher. And I can be, but I'm going to make you work harder yeah. than you've worked in any year you've been in elementary school. And it, it was the it was the truth. They mm -hmm. worked extremely hard. But like you said, we, we worked hard, but then we had fun hard. And, we, you know, we we did all those those extra things because they earned it. And because because they wanted to, because they they had that investment in learning. How do you how do you convey that message to teachers in a way that makes them feel empowered versus diminished? Well, I try to personalize it and have them recall the environments that where they thrive and where they, and it's almost always, I feel cared for. I feel safe. I feel loved. I feel challenged. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's how we know if we're doing our job each day. Do our kids feel successful? Do they feel challenged? Do they feel loved? If we've got all three of those things, I just can't imagine how we could possibly do it any better with the hours in front of our students. What was... What was the most difficult thing for you to become confident in as a teacher? So for me, it was reading instruction. I, I'm a, a math person. Math was what I thrived in. Mm -hmm. uh, writing even became easier for me first than reading. Reading was the one that I had to work really hard and really lean on my colleagues for. What was, what was that subject or that content or that unit for you in the classroom? And, and how, did you, how did you grow in that area to be really an instructional coach that can help any teacher in any subject mm -hmm. in, in any grade level. I don't know if it was a subject, Ken. I think it was, I, I keep thinking of some of my former multilingual learners. Mm -hmm. And when they would come into my classroom um, with my background in as a reading specialist and a fellow of the National Writing Project, reading and writing, that's my jam. Like, Ken, mm -hmm. we would have been a perfect team mm -hmm. teacher. <laughs> group. I mean, if I could have just, we could read and write all day, that would be glorious. But when you have a multilingual learner come in, math is much easier to help them grasp, um, in my experience anyway, than reading and writing. And so it was trying, even with a reading specialist degree, it was so hard to figure out how to meet these students where they were and to make them, I could make them feel loved. I could certainly make them feel challenged, but I couldn't always make them feel successful in reading and writing. And that was a really tricky thing for me. Um, so again, it was reaching out to really smart, dedicated colleagues who knew what they were doing and could help provide resources. And I had to learn, it wasn't a student issue. It was also a teacher issue. I had to learn some new tools, which quite frankly, 
I don't know I had the capacity for um, in that season of my life where I had really young kids and, you know, just trying to move through pro personal seasons and professional seasons. It was really tricky, but I knew that my students needed to feel success. And so I had to have job one, make sure to be to help them as much as I could. And now we got crafty. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and now I'm sure you're seeing that in your, in your district more than anything, the, the growing population of those yeah. of our multilingual students is any, any district I talk to, this is mm -hmm. one of the, they're not concerned, but concerned in terms of supporting teachers in supporting these students. And I personally think it is the most challenging population of student to support because you want to try so hard and you want to do so much, but you come overcoming just the simple barrier of language right. is, is the most difficult thing to overcome. Um, do you have any advice for, go ahead. Well, there's just so many nuances as well, mm -hmm. right? So we were just working on making some universal signage for our schools so that any newcomers who came would, they would see the bathroom and recognize it was the bathroom or the nurse or the main office. And my daughter, actually, she's 15. She taught herself Russian and Ukrainian through Duolingo. So that was something that was important to her because she wanted to help her friends in school. And so we would try it in our best effort and interest can try to, um, you know, make sure that things were, why can it translate it? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, I couldn't think of the word translated <laughs> appropriately. And so she looked at some of our translations and said, mom, the, the word you're using for nurse actually means babysitter, you know, and it, it's just these like little nuances in languages that we have to recognize and, and try and be as sympathetic and empathetic for. And I think the, I don't want to sugarcoat it by any means, but when working with a multilingual student, that human connection, the eye contact, the body language, the, the slowing down to be as present as possible with them can really be, be the brightest gifts of our day, even though it's so, so hard. I, I agree because they, they don't necessarily know that they are be that they're connected to you through language. So yeah. that that slow pace, that eye contact, those little nuances of body language are really mm -hmm. gonna really gonna help them. My first experience was a student who transitioned out of the EL class, yeah. which was at another school in our district, and came to my classroom. And I I remember the first epiphany for me was we were doing some activity in reading. And he came up to me and asked me the meaning of a word. And, and I don't remember what the word was, but it was, I almost said like, you really don't know what that is from a fifth grade mindset. Sure. But then yeah. I realized the, the, the absence of background knowledge became more and more apparent to me. And I made a strong effort to make sure that not only for that student, but for every student, we were leveling the playing field yeah. on background knowledge of the context we were talking about, the time period, those different aspects, because they just, they lack those, those different pieces. And it's, right. it's really hard to, it's, it's extremely hard for teachers to service them and to provide the supports as best as possible. And I think nowadays, at least technology is making it easier yes. with translation. Like you said, it's, it's not always perfect, but it at least allows us to, to do our best and at the very least translate as much as possible, even if they don't necessarily need all of it translated, mm -hmm. it's still, it's still there for them. So you mentioned a little bit with your, your transition of like balancing home and home and um, the professional life. So you've done a lot outside of your work with central Buck. So please share what that, I'm sure it kind of started as a side passion, but what that's really blossomed into and, and how you're having such a positive impact on, on teaching. Thanks. So about, I would say eight-ish years ago, I got really interested in positive psychology and you know how districts have like conference days, right? And there's, you know, workshops for, for teachers to sign up with. I, my, my friend Jen and I did the well-balanced teacher and we thought, well, this sounds good. And it was a 90 minute session and we kind of pulled from a lot of different resources and like, it was one of the first sessions to fill up. We we're like, wow, I'm sure it's not us, it, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was the topic and teachers are like, whoa, we've never really talked about like taking care of ourselves. It's always about the students. And so who was it? Can, he, she was just on your podcast. I wrote it down. 
Grace, what did Grace, Grace Stevenson, mm -hmm. she said, your energy teaches more than your lesson plans. She said that on your podcast. And I, like, that is so brilliant and so wise and insightful. And so I started noticing it wasn't just us at the elementary level or elementary and secondary or just in our districts. This was a, a common interest and something that just wasn't getting a lot of attention. There's a lot of self-help out there, but very rare is it just for us as teachers. And with such a outward, people-y, giving, nurturing profession, well, we need to feel, you know, nurtured and balanced as much as we can. And so what I started doing was doing little blog posts or more workshops. And then like some of those workshops went to other districts and especially through the pandemic and in coming out on the other side of the pandemic, understanding how important teacher wellness is. And so from that came a podcast called Teach Happier and a book called Teach Happier this school year. And so now I get to share my book and podcast and get to go to districts all over the country. And it's just really exciting. And all of that work though, Ken, is not like a yay Suzanne thing. It just shows how much we need each other in education. Teachers in Denver are having similar challenges as teachers in Philadelphia and Tallahassee. And it's it's really universal. And I think that's why it's resonating so much with so many colleagues. So I just have to say, I love that you quoted my podcast on my podcast. Well, of course. You're, Is that uh, weird? You're, 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 no, it's great. Makes me feel makes me feel like at least I know one person's listening. That's a that's a first <laughs> for that. So that was that was great. Grace Grace was a great conversation. Her um, voice and, was so lovely to listen to. Yes, yes, definitely. And so I will say that, and I, I don't want this to sound conceited at all. Mm -hmm. Positive psychology, I feel like, is something that I didn't gravitate towards because I didn't feel like I needed it, and and I, I don't know why that is. I, I think through just through everything that I've gone through in my life work ethic and, and hard work has been how I've reached levels of success that I have in different avenues, whether it be sports mm -hmm. or even, you know, my relationship with my wife and my kids. Um, but listening to you, reading your book and, and, and hearing you speak in person, it made me realize how much uh, need there is for it, for teachers, as well as people outside of education and how much it is not a, you know, shake pom poms and, and, you know, you know, have a pep rally kind of thing. It is grounded in good work ethic, good ideas, and, and, um, just like a very succinct way to, to approach that. So that's what I enjoyed about your presentation and, and everything that you do so much, because it, it is that, and I think it's something practical that, that teachers can, can really work for and, and work towards and, and utilize. So what would you say is a flag for a teacher to say, I personally need to look into this more to help me be a better teacher, a better person, or just be happier with myself? I, I really appreciate, Ken, you saying that it's not like pom poms and unicorns. It's not toxic positivity. Like there's just mm -hmm. no space for that. We are done hearing like, you're going to do it for the kids and you've got this. Like we, we are, we deserve more than that, in my opinion. And so if you're a human being, there are going to be, you, you heard me reference the word seasons before. Personally, professionally, we're going to go through really great seasons and we're going to go through some really challenging seasons. And that's just admission of life. Like that's what we're doing. And so we're, we, we've never done this before. This is our first go around as human beings, right? So I've never been a 44 year old woman of a parent of a 14 and 15 year old before that is brand new to me. And so I'm going to need more tools in order to navigate these seasons in the healthiest. We like to say in the podcast, a healthy head space and heart space. And so that little flag that you were referencing earlier, it's where you feel heaviness, you feel hurry, you feel like this frenetic pace, whether it's in your head or your heart, and you just can't discern your next right thing in a aligned, content, anchored way. And that's really what all this work is. It's, it's, you know, we live in a very unsteady world. So what can we do 
in our thoughts and our language or our actions to just feel a little steadier. I'm not saying we're going to be two feet firmly steady. Like th that might be unrealistic during some seasons. We just want to feel a little bit more grounded in the work that we do, both in the classroom and at home. We have a profession that like we can't just leave it at the door. I mean, we'd like to think we can, but our, we're always thinking about that student or that colleague. And then when we're at work, we're thinking about something at home. Or like, it's just, we have so many people around us all day long that it's hard to, to make that separation. And so that takes a little bit of work. And so when I was at your school district, Ken, we talked about the number one rule in whitewater rafting is be a part of your own rescue. And happiness is an inside job. Well-being is an inside job. And, but once you know some of these tools and strategies, it's, it's actually a pretty realistic and attainable thing to do if you treat it like a discipline. Elaborate on that, because I love the word discipline. So I know it has a negative connotation, but people will often say to me, Suzanne, you're just like always in a good mood, which isn't true, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, but I, I do have a higher happiness baseline, but I'm not always in a good mood. But I'll tell you what, I work really hard every day to be in the, in the healthiest headspace and heart space. Like when I wake up in the morning, I move my body. I understand what science says, the correlation between physical health and mental health. Got it. Every morning I'm up, I'm moving my body. I can think clearer. I have better perspective. I have more patience. Win-win. Every night, the most impactful 10 seconds of my day is writing in a gratitude journal. I've written in a gratitude journal since the 1990s when Oprah told me to. <laughs> That's a discipline. That's showing up every day, moving my body, being grateful, trying to strengthen my social relationships, whether I'm sending a couple of texts. It, it, it's nothing big, Ken. Like I, it's so underwhelming, but it's that disciplined practice. It's showing up consistently as often as we can with the capacity that we have for that day and trying to do what we can to be a part of our own rescue. It's an inside job. Yeah, I, I love that. Have you ever read the book Atomic Habits? I sure have. But yeah, that's where we, remember we did consistency over intensity. Mm -hmm. Intensity. That's mm -hmm. James Clare. Took it right from him. I credited him though. If you're listening, <laughs> James, I always credit you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's a he's a weekly subscriber. Yeah, he's probably listening. Um, he's listening. So I'm, I'm reading that book right now because I, I personally am trying to reach areas of improvement where I've, I felt like I've lacked the discipline. And so for me personally, I wake up very early in the morning mm -hmm. um, and it's my time where my kids are still sleeping. My wife is still sleeping. And there are days where I, I sleep in and I, I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old and a, and a two-year-old. So, or I'm sorry, four and a three-year-old. So when I say sleep in, it's like seven o'clock in the morning. Sure. <laughs> um, but it's, it's funny those days when I didn't intend on sleeping in the night before, I don't enjoy my morning. Mm -hmm. If I make the conscious decision the night before to say, you know what, I'm just going to relax. I'm going to wake up with everybody and enjoy my time with everybody. Then I do feel better. So it kind of, kind of feeds into that discipline piece. But, um, the gratitude thing is something that I never really did before. And after actually when we, you and I first really spent time together at the Teach Better conference and yeah. our, our good friend, Rob, he talks a lot about <laughs> gratitude and it was something that my wife and I had talked about a lot and we started to do a little bit more together, we did journaling off and on. And now every night at dinner, the thing that we all share is something that we're grateful for that day or thankful for that day or, or something that we enjoyed that day. And we do a little poem as a family and, and we also call it bringing down the silence that we learned from my son's school. Mm. And that moment, I feel so much more peaceful when we have that together before the kids start going crazy again at, at the dinner table. But it's still something that I think my wife and I have really grown to appreciate. And, and I think my kids will at some point when they when they mm -hmm. realize it. But, you know, that's it's that's simple. Right. And in Atomic yeah. Habits, they talk about habit stacking. We eat dinner every day. So mm -hmm. do it at dinner, right? So it's something that you've already done and that, and that you can build upon with that. How and the fact that your kids get to see that, Ken, I mean, gratitude is the super virtue. That will permanently increase your happiness baseline, permanently. So the fact that your kids, as young as they are, are noticing that, they're just being taught to scan for the good. And if that habit becomes so natural to them, 
they are just going to move through their days in such a better space. That's amazing. Such a gift. Well, I hope so. Yeah. So how do some of these things translate into your work as an instructional coach? How do you blend this in in your work with teachers or your or your work with students or even like adapting lessons to involve some of these these happiness features? So actually, there are lessons in the book, Teach Happier This School Year, that we use with real kids in real time. And so I want second graders to understand how important gratitude is. I want sixth graders to understand how to strengthen social relationships in a healthy way, right? I just think if if we were taught this at our age, like what an empowering thing that this could be. But as an instructional coach, right? So I'm among 15 buildings. So I'm zooming around all the time and there's always opportunities to connect and strengthen relationships, but I can't really be slow about it or I'll never get anywhere. (laughs) So the way I start conversations 95% of the time, I'll see you in the hall, Ken, you you be with your, your, you know, your old fifth graders. And I'd be like, Hey, Mr. Ehrman, tell me something good. And you'd say, tell me something good. Um, outdoor recess today. I'm like, yes. <laughs> right. So mm-hmm. just tell me something good. And sometimes that's really easy for folks to come up with. Sometimes they got to dig a little bit, but just as we want to show our students, it all counts. Anything that you would consider good on that particular day counts. And so when I'm working with new teachers or master teachers, just tell me something good. And that just kind of puts everybody's shoulders down, kind of, you know, makes the conversation platform a little more comfortable and real and primes our brain for, you know, in a strengths-based way. So that's easy. (laughs) I love that. How have you seen that permeate amongst others? Like, are are they saying it to you before you can say it to them? Or do you hear them saying it to their students or amongst their colleagues? Yeah. I don't, I don't care if they say it to me. I I want them asking their first graders, their sixth graders, tell me something good. Right. So my kids, I have a middle schooler and a high schooler, their friends get in the car. They'll be like, all right, Mrs. Daly, I got my good thing. Like, I don't (laughs) even have to ask now. Right. Like, do they think it's annoying? Are my kids embarrassed? Sure. But Mm -hmm. that's fine. I've got 14 and 16 year olds telling me what's going good in their life. And that's, that's a habit. That's a practice. That's a discipline, but they don't know that yet. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. What, what, what would you say are some of the other key pieces of happiness as, as a human, as a teacher? So what I always try to do, Ken, and I think most instructional coaches do this is seeing the person behind the title. So I could be with a reading specialist, a third grade teacher, a special education teacher, a principal, an assistant superintendent. It almost doesn't matter. I want to know the person behind that title. I want to know what motivates them. I want to know what affirms them, what makes them feel important and heard. And just as we would do with our students, we're just scaling up, right? Mm -hmm. And just trying to understand and, and meet them where they are so that our time together can not only be efficient and effective, but we both leave that interaction feeling good and empowered, almost like a little charging station, right? We've all been in conversations where we walk away and we're like, oh my God. <laughs> and you just kind of feel like depleted or frustrated. I, I, I don't want that to be the feeling after our interactions. And so that's really important. And that's what Brene Brown always says. It's people, people, people. That's what she says before she does any big talk. It's not about the stuff and it's not about their titles. It's about the people especially in our line of work. How, how can we reflect on that ourselves and, and make sure that we are not depleting others in conversation? Um, I forget who I, who I saw speak or, or reading it somewhere, talking about you know not being the one to disarm meetings or uh, feel like you're talking over others. And it really started to make, cause me to reflect on how I interacted with my colleagues not even so much as is the the coaching conversations that's something that I've I definitely did not do mm-hmm. great when I started but over time I've become better in the way I interact with teachers reading what they're looking for from me whether it's just affirming questions or or they want my ideas or or what have you but when I'm amongst my my coaching team or even working with our supervisors and we're planning things making sure that I am being a positive member of that meeting and not depleting or being um, too overbearing or or 
creating those negative energies in that meeting. So how can we reflect on that ourselves to make sure that we are adding energy to the ones that we work with? It's a good question, Ken. Have you heard of that quote? I don't know who said it. It's don't adapt to the energy in the room, influence the energy in the room. I think of that multiple times a day, whether I'm going into a classroom or a meeting, whatever the energy is in there, almost doesn't matter to me. I want to go in there and see, and again, it's not pom-poms and unicorns. It's just, I want to go in there anchored, steady, calm, kind of read the room. I think as instructional coaches were, and teachers, we're always thermostats, right? Like we're adjusting up and adjusting down. But something I really learned, at, a big takeaway that I had at Jim Knight's instructional coaching conference in um, in October was not to be an advice monster is what they kept calling all the little breakout sessions. That's what they kept calling it. And if, if you're listening to this podcast and you're also an instructional coach, that's legitimately our job is to give people advice and try to help empower them. But exactly to your point, Ken, if we come in too hot, then that advice isn't going to be well received. And so that's why going back to understanding who exactly is this person I'm talking to, how do they tend to want to receive information? Asking good questions is, you know, really great. I'm not naturally a good question asker. I usually think of the questions like when I'm in the car, I'm like, ah, I should have asked about, right? Mm -hmm. But what I do all the time, my reminders app on my phone is always full with people and then like a quick thing, right? So if, if I thought of a question that I didn't ask, I will write it in my reminders app. And when I get back, I, I'll shoot a quick email. Or if if I hear like, ooh, you know, Noelle's been out for a few weeks, like she's got, you know, insert medical something going on. I jot it in my reminders and then I reach out to her. Hey, Noelle, I heard you were under the weather. I hope you're doing well. It's just those little micro moments of connection and just making people feel seen and heard and valued as much as realistically possible. It's hard. It's very hard. And for new or experienced instructional coaches, I could not agree more with, with the advice monster. I, I like the yeah. phrasing of that. I a hundred percent was doing that when I, when I started as a coach and I, I think part of it is I'm naturally a problem solver. Um, part of it was I was an elementary teacher and I was moved up to being a secondary instructional coach. So mm -hmm. I think a little bit of it was, I wanted to prove myself to sure. those teachers that I was a valuable asset and could support them and, and provide new ideas and, and, and support what they were doing instructionally. Uh, just this past week, we were at a little local coaching uh, network event. And I was, I was not present, invited, but go on. Um, well, this is through the <laughs> IU. So you got to, you got to take it up with them. Um, I was asked to present on my pod about my podcast. Mm. And I have a clip when I had Jimmy, Jimmy Casas on who Love I know you Jimmy. are a huge fan of. And I talked to him about an approach I had with a teacher that I worked with. And he pointed out everything that was good, but was wrong because it started immediately, immediately with me being a problem solver. And he didn't tell me I was wrong. He had a much more I'm appropriate sure way of, yes. of navigating it. <laughs> but, you know, he, it got to the point where he said like, you know, you probably felt good about yourself. You probably felt like you were stroking your ego a little bit, but they're always going to come back to me to solve more problems. And that's not what we should be doing as coaches. We should be mm -hmm. asking questions. And so that, that advice monster is really hard to fight off as coaches. And I even think that can apply to classroom teachers as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. We spend our day directing students, telling students what to do, provide, giving them advice, redirecting them instead of asking more questions, right? Mm -hmm. So what are, what are some ways that you like to model questioning with students? And you can give us a specific lesson or a specific scenario, but where do you like to model that for teachers? I think it comes more, I don't know if, if it's through questioning or more validation. You know, a teacher could say something like, oh my gosh, this is just impossible. I can't teach insert new curriculum. This is really hard. And just to hear, yeah, this sounds like it's really hard. Yeah, this would be challenging. Yeah, like just to validate. Mm -hmm. Then often once, I, I really do find this, Ken, once the person feels validated, then they start problem 
solving on their own a little bit, right? Mm. They just need to feel like, yes, of course, this is hard. We've never taught this curriculum before. Yeah, we're all, you know, going through some growing pains. And it kind of goes back to that parenting advice. Like, do you want me to listen or do you want advice? I think often that's also, hus- that's also husband yeah, advice. That's really good advice. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that's really true with our colleagues too. Sometimes they just want to vent. And so when going back to that advice monster, they said the perfect pie chart of an effective instructional coaching session, whether it's 10 minutes or an hour is 80, 20. 80% should be the other person talking, 20% should be us. 20% should just be those little nudges, those little prompts, the little moments of validation to help get them as close as they can to feeling like they got to that solution on their own as much as possible. That's hard. That's hard. Mm-hmm. And I would use the exact same ratio to describe teaching with them working yeah. with students, right? That's a great point. We're teaching, yep. Insert any subject, any grade level, the students that you're working with, they should be doing 80% of the talking. They should be doing 80% of the thinking. They should be doing <laughs> 80% of, of the work. And it's us nudging them along the way, giving them the next problem, giving them the next writing prompt, giving them the next piece of advice to mm-hmm. you know, work on their on their reading comprehension or the next question for them to think about versus just validating and and giving the answer right away or acknowledging the answer right away and and like you said it's hard right it's very hard yeah how how do you feel how do you feel you've developed your ability to ask the right questions or give the right nudge um are you are you thinking about it before you go there are you planning a little bit before you go there do you feel you've had so many experiences that you can kind of adjust and think on the fly Yes, and especially a lot of my work is with new teachers. So just this year, we have 78 new teachers who, that's kind of like my classroom each year, are mm-hmm. are our new hires. And so when it comes to new teachers, it's the, the issues are usually in some pretty typical buckets, right? It's It's classroom management, it's active engagement with students, it's teachers over talking, you know, it, these little language moves. And so with new teachers, I, I, I typically feel like, okay, it's probably going to go one of these few ways, but it's with my fellow veteran colleagues, right? That I can prepare as much as possible, but oftentimes things will not go as, as I think they're going to, which is just like teaching to your point. And so then you, you troubleshoot together and, and you just let them know, like, listen, I am here to help you and I'll ask you questions and you ask me questions and we're all, we want the ultimate goal is the same, right? We want to, you know, increase student engagement, have more opportunities for the whole class to respond. Like whatever the goal is, like, of course, that's what we want to do together, but just helping folks understand that it's really a parallel process and we're, we're doing the important work together, whether, and, you know, whether we're celebrating some really great successes and, you know, in one person's definition of success might be different for somebody else, but you just got to validate them and let them know that, yes, we did it. Like, this is amazing. You know, um, just in the same way as when there's a really hard challenge and the work is just a different type of lift. Teaching is a lift. It's a heavy lift, whether things you have a great class and things are going really well, or if it's a more of a challenging class and you've got a lot of, you know, new strategies to try out. It's, it's heavy lift and teachers need validated no matter what their year looks like. It's, it's definitely, it's interesting to move into the instructional coach role for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. And you are 12 years now, you said, Mm -hmm. yep. How do you, how have you stayed so in touch with the classroom? And, and I can say from my interactions with you that you definitely still get it. Right. Thank the you. typical mantra of, of administrators is the longer they're out of the classroom, the less they that they get that. And I think that's very true for some yeah. administrators. And I don't think that's true for others. And coaching is is that interesting position because you are in a you are a leader for your district and you are not teaching your class on a daily basis. But you have to stay in touch with teaching yeah. because the teachers rely on you to, to be their first line of defense. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have 
for keeping that relevancy and, and, and staying in tune and in touch with, with, with what it's like to be a teacher. I really appreciate you asking this, Ken, because I am a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I teach every day. Today, I taught third grade and sixth grade. Yes, they are not my, my own class, right? But I have to teach every single day for a few reasons. The first is, that's my credibility to my colleagues, right? The minute somebody says, Suzanne doesn't get it anymore, is that's a problem for me, right? And I, and I never want a colleague to think that way. So teaching every day is huge. And because of, of credibility. And secondly, I have to be able to say, I know what we were doing five years ago isn't working anymore, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm trying to do the things five years ago and it's not working, right? So that is just so important. So boots on the ground is essential. I want, you know, even if Ken, maybe if I'm not teaching in your classroom, maybe I'm teaching across the hall from you, but I want you to see that I'm, I'm teaching and that I'm trying and to be like, you know what, I don't know how we can fit in all of these three things that the administrators are asking us to do. How about I come in, let me hijack your insert subject area for like the whole week and let's see if we can figure this out. Because how great is it when I try to come in and it doesn't work, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And then, then that collaborative problem solving happens like, okay, right, it's really tricky to do calendar math and a full math and focus lesson within 80 minutes when time is being taken from the beginning and the end for this reason or that reason, how do we do this? Then as the instructional coach, I might have a voice around a table to say, okay, supervisors, principals, anyone else around the table, like this isn't working. This looks great on paper. Love it. Doesn't work in real life. And here's how. And when we have coaches doing that, when we have principals doing that, that is the collective efficacy I think we all dream about. I have a scenario for you. Let's do it. Are you certified as an administrator? Nope. And I okay. never will be. <clears throat> Let's pretend you are. Okay. That seems hard. But this is probably going to sway the answer anyway. <laughs> what would, if you were an administrator, what would be your ideal position? For me, it's elementary principal. That would be, that would be my well, top I could choice. survive nowhere else. Is that what it would be, elementary principal? Well, it would have I didn't to know be. if you would be like reading supervisor or curriculum or Oh, I could do that. I could do that. I any guess administrator. If 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 I was a certified administrator, which is just any of my colleagues listening to this or laughing out loud hearing that, I would love to be in charge of writing. Okay. Like English See, writing. Yeah. K to six, K to twelve. Well, ideally K to six, but I All feel right. like that would be That's luxury. Okay. <laughs> so you are the you either get to be the okay. writing K mm -hmm. to six mm -hmm. administrator. Okay. Or you get to be sixth grade math teacher. What are you choosing and why? Oh, sixth grade math. <laughs> <laughs> we picked your most ideal administrator position and probably one of your least ideal. No, this is teaching. a really good question. <laughs> I really, I, that is a really hard because if it, because you're saying if I'm an administrator, then that then I'm done teaching. Is that is that the scenario? Well, I'm not saying that you can't ever do that again, but that's part that of that would what... be the deciding factor. Can mm -hmm. I still be in the classroom in real time teaching real kids real things? If the answer was no, I would begrudgingly go to math. But to to not be in in classrooms would be a really hard thing for me. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I agree, and it's 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 tough as a coach because you at some point you might have you may have to make that decision whether the position changes or mm -hmm. or even like let's just say you feel as though you've lost it a little bit with with being able to best serve mm -hmm. your teachers you kind of have to decide do you do you move up or do you move down or oh down or what that put me in a that shift classroom. takes <laughs> no it's sixth grade math that's the that's the only choice mm, you get that's, that's tough. That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> so so as you said much earlier in the conversation, you and I would have would have been great, great, great partners together. We really the, would be. the reading, the reading and the math. If you went back into the classroom, mm -hmm. what would be different about the way you teach math now than when you were in the classroom and, and, and would it be better and why? Well, it would be better because I've gotten to see so many, I, literally hundreds of colleagues teach math 
all around the district. So I could pick the best parts of mm -hmm. everybody that I've seen, which is amazing. It's a totally different program right now. So it's a much better program. So I think it would be better that way. I also wouldn't be as scared. I think mm -hmm. now, um, I, I, it might surprise you, but I think I took more things too seriously than I needed to in my fourth grade classroom. And to kind of have a little more perspective and experience with it to know that, oh gosh, that doesn't really matter. Or <laughs> that's not going, they're, they're still going to be able to do math well. They're still going to be able to problem solve. It just, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe everything isn't as, it, it can't be as equally important as everything else. But sometimes I, I absolutely would fall into that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the the not being so scared is mm -hmm. a huge, a huge piece, just being confident in, in what you're doing. And, and like you said, knowing that it's okay, if yeah. they don't master this one thing, it'll be okay. If you don't teach this skill the best, it'll be okay. Yeah. But seeing people teach is one of the greatest gifts that, that you can have as a teacher. And if you're listening to this podcast, reach out to whoever you can mm -hmm. reach out to, to give you that opportunity. Yeah. As a coaching team, this has been one of our big initiatives the last two years of, of giving tag outs where teachers email us and say, I want to see blank, whether it's a strategy mm -hmm. or they might just say, I want to see someone else that teaches the same class as me. And we arrange coverages. We cover the class ourselves. It puts a coach in there so we can still, you know, elevate the curriculum and, and not pass it off to a sub that might not do it as well. And we try to get them to another building and just give them the right. opportunity to see. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this so many times. They go to see something specific and they come back with so many of these little <laughs> ideas, strategies. I never thought to have my students take attendance this way, or I never yes. thought to have them sign put, out to go to the bathroom. This put their way. water bottles in a different spot. Like <laughs> right. that was the thing. All right. Great. Right. Yep. But it's seeing other people teach is, is such a gift and seeing yourself teach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on, what's your opinion on filming yourself for teaching? Oh, I think it's great. I often, um, especially with newer teachers who tend to over talk, especially when there's an administrator in the room, mm -hmm. I just say like, can you just toss your phone on and hit record and just listen to yourself? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And then that really will drive the point home of, Again, here's another quote. I don't know who said it. Like whoever's doing the talking is doing the learning. And so when we over talk and we do things for our students that they could get to on their own, mm -hmm. you know, we are undermining their long-term success where just all that bubble wrap is sometimes a little too much. So let them struggle a little bit, that productive struggle so that they can get in, you know, closer to their goal without our handholding, just, you know, spotting every now and then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we do it with our new teachers as well. And it was, it was the best session of new teacher induction yeah. from, from their feedback. The first time I filmed myself, my biggest takeaway was the way I executed wait time was repeating the question over and over and over again. <laughs> until some until kids I had, like, I'll do it, right, Mr. Herman. <laughs> right. Until one of them raised their hands or until I felt enough of them had raised their hands instead of asking the question once and then truly waiting in silence. Um, for that, for that wait time, I would even explain to my kids what wait time was because they would say like that, you know, a couple of kids would be like, Mr. Ehrman, my hand is raised. And I would say, I know I'm using wait time. Wait time is where I give everybody the opportunity to think and participate. Yeah. And I actually think it got more of them to participate because they knew why I was waiting and they couldn't get away with, with not paying attention. But even, even to film your, your teaching to observe the students, mm -hmm. right? When we're, when we're in the act of teaching, there's so many things that we are focused on having that time to not even pay attention to yourself, but just look at all yeah. of the things that the students are doing. How many of them are actually taking notes? How many of them are glancing at their cell phone? How many of them are, you know, just staring off in the space, like taking data on those students and observing what effect your, your teaching, your teaching has, I think is a, is a really important aspect as well. And anybody who's gone through national board certification, that's what you do. You film your, your class, you film yourself teaching, and then you have to narrate all of your instructional moves and why you did that in real time. Mm. So you have to make all that invisible stuff very visible and overt, and it's really powerful professional development. Um, so if anyone wants to do national board... Yeah, can, and, you, can you speak to that? Oh, yeah. So I was certified in... Two, I have to look, 2007. 
And so there are, it, the, the process has changed a little bit. I was just recertified in 2017. You have to do it every 10 years. But essentially, in a you know two-sentence summary, you talk about what do you do outside of your classroom walls to make sure that you are preparing yourself to be the best teacher you can in front of your kids. So that's master's programs, classes, um, volunteering and doing homeschool connection things, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then you have to film a couple of lessons and then talk through your instructional moves. Why did you ask the questions you did? Why did you choose on, why did you ask the, the specific students to share? Um, how many opportunities to respond did you have in a certain amount of time? You have to dissect everything you do, including wait time, Ken. Like that's, it's just so powerful. And so when I went through the process, I had this great lesson plan, Ken. It was so good. It was science and we had these thermometers and we were putting them in the soil and we were reading the digital thing. And it, like at that time, that was like mm -hmm. really high tech. <laughs> and it was a total disaster, total disaster because I was trying to just do too much. And we all know as teachers, the minute we try to do too much, it fails. 100% of the time. And so I'm like, whoa, 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 pull this back. Like you're not doing this for the film. You're doing this for your students. What would you do in a typical science lesson that you're going to do less better, right? And you're going to examine the basic fundamental teaching moves, the questioning, the wait time, the productive student talk time, the hands-on learning, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really powerful. It's it's a rigorous, rigorous process, though. So I would recommend if somebody is interested in that, you want to check with your school district to see if there's any kind of incentive for you to achieve national board certification. There is in my school district. Um, you get a certain amount of money each year. Um, so that's kind of, that's a great incentive. Mm -hmm. And so and you can accrue uh, credits as well. So I. You said it's very rigorous. You had to, what yeah. other than filming the lesson, like is a lot of, do you have to take classes? Do you have to, well, guess is how, it a lot of what's writing? The percent, what's the percent of teachers who have national board certification? You get two guess. guesses. <laughs> I get two guesses. Uh-huh. Right. Um, 7%. Less. Two and a half. Less than 1% of teachers have national board certification. So it is such, I, I just think such a prestigious accreditation. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's reflective. Um, it's just being a reflective practitioner, being able to speak to your instructional decisions. Um, if you had to do the lesson again, what would you adjust, right? It's, it's that deep reflection that really good teachers naturally do every single day, but you have to make it clear to somebody who doesn't know you right? Wherever the scoring is, somebody's watching this video and who don't, they don't know who Ken Ehrman is. They don't know that he's right. this great instructional coach with a podcast, it, right? Like he's just mm -hmm. this guy from Pennsylvania. So right. you just, it, again, it's really those, those basic fundamental teaching moves that you, you have to defend almost of, of why you're making those decisions. It's really powerful. How much time would you say you have to commit <laughs> to completing the process? like in hours or days or whatever the most, most logical people, unit of measure would be. Most people do it in two years, meaning like like two school years. So okay. um, I was like, we're knocking this thing out. Like if we're doing it, we're doing it. And so I did it mm -hmm. in one year, which was rigorous and aggressive. It was before I had kids. So mm -hmm. I had, you know, all kinds of time comparatively to what I feel like I have now. Um, and then you also have to take, but I didn't mention a test. So okay. there's four components. The fourth component is, is a test where you go to a, a you know, a testing center and, and talk about teaching. Mm -hmm. There's multiple choice, there's scenarios. Um, yeah, I, you've got to study for it. You got to prepare for it. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's something that I've, I've heard of, and I've been aware of. I knew you were, I knew you were certified. I don't mm -hmm. think I know anyone else, which would make sense since, like you said, it's less than 1%. Um, it's something that I, I never really looked into too much. So was, I'm very curious about the, the process. Yeah, I would something highly recommend I, it. And you could just, you know, hop on their website and it gives you an overview because you'll get, 
if you do decide to pursue, you choose um, a certification area. So mine is middle childhood generalist. So that would be between okay. fourth and eighth grade. You know, if you are a secondary science teacher, that's a different one. If you are a family consumer science teacher, that's a different one. So you want to choose the certification area that you're that you're in, which makes sense, right? Like a mm -hmm. kindergarten certification should look and feel very different than a physics. Yep, that makes sense. Does it cost a lot to do? So yeah, it does. I forget the exact cost, but if your district has an incentive, then and you can get credits for it. To me, mm -hmm. that it kind of like washes right. out, and right, right, right. you know, over time, you're you could be making money from it. Right. Yep, that makes sense. Last question. Yes, sir. And this might be a stupid question. Mm -hmm. Are you literally certified to teach in any state with that, or is it just an accreditation? It's is a really it a great national question. accreditation? Yeah, you, certified everywhere. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean like if I went to New Jersey, they're like, oh, you still have to do like this one whatever. Right. But that is, is, a, is a blanket certification. Yeah, great question. That's why it's called national certification, which is what I should have started with. <laughs> well, you did say that, but I... I didn't want to be so naive to assume that that's literally what it meant, or if yeah. it was just a, you know, a, a, if it, if the accreditation was called national certification, but it wasn't actually that, you know, how all these yeah, they organizations say, like to have names that don't really mean anything. But here, here's, the, here's how rigorous it is. And then we'll stop because if people aren't interested in this, they're like bored right now. More people pass the bar pass the bar exam on the first time, then get national board certification on the first time. So let's say you submit everything and you pass components one, three, and four, then you have the opportunity to redo two, and, you know, like that second chance learning. So oftentimes you have to go back and, you know, just strengthen a few things. So that's why, that's why it's such a, a prestigious accreditation, I guess. I'm even more impressed now. Uh -oh. It's more impressive than a CPA, a bar. <laughs> well, wow. again, our work is hard and complicated, right? That's true. That's very true. So so to to wrap things up before we jump into our, our exit ticket, the final four questions, what would be the next step of advice you would provide to a teacher that feels as though they need to start to utilize positive psychology to help them feel better every day? One, I'm going to give advice myself. Listen to your podcast, which we will oh, link up and read you. your book. But you know, something that they can action, actionably do in their lives. So we're looking for advice of like, what's your next right thing? Like something like that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I would say if you like, and I'm not saying this because I have a podcast, but like if you're in the car a lot and you just want to hear just something, there are so many great podcasts out there mm -hmm. that talk about these little moves we can do. The Happiness Lab is one of my favorites. That's with Dr. Lori Santos from Yale. Um, and then like Oprah was just on that one. I just listened to one today. Like there is so much available to us through podcasts and books and little documentaries that we might as well just pop something in our ears and, and see what we can, we can learn. Right. We talk about what is our diet? Like what is the food that we're putting into our bodies, but what's our media diet. And so listen, I love me a good inappropriate, hilarious podcast that's like for after school. But in the morning, one of my habits are listening to some of these really great podcasts based in positive psychology that I'm hoping I hear something in the morning that will help, you know, start my day off on the right foot. So the tools are all around us. It's just a matter of deciding, deciding to take advantage of it. I would agree with that. I have you ever listened to School of Greatness with Lil yes. Styles? Yeah. That's another one that I, I really enjoy. I think he's got a lot of He's got a good diversity to what, what he brings, health, yep. you know, um, movement, exercise, and, and a lot on, on mindfulness. As, as I'm well. glad you brought that one back up. I haven't listened to that in a little while, so thank you. Absolutely. So we're going to wrap things up here with our exit ticket. Okay, Last I'm ready. Four questions we ask every guest every week. You've listened to the show, so you are prepared and ready. Maybe I'll change them up just to throw <gasps> them off. Don't you dare. I have notes. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm going to need you to put your phone away okay. and talk from the heart. I will. What is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student school experience better? Model emotional wellness. So, you know, we always say like, who's the best reader in the room? Us. Who's the best writer in the room? Us. Who's the most emotionally regulated person in the room? Well, bad news, guys. It's us. So how do we model that for our students? They are going to see us disappointed. They're going to see us become frustrated. 
they are watching everything that we do, right? It's it's not kids don't do as we say, they do as no, they, they kids don't do as we say, they do as they see. So they're seeing and they are listening. And so how can we model that for them? I love that. What is the best advice you've ever received, whether it be from a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student? Try to quiet the noise. And if you can't quiet it, turn it down as much as you can and focus on the real stuff. Who told that, you that noise could be school board. It could be gossip. It could be mm -hmm. drama. Just lower it as much as we can to do the important work in front of us. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's hard. Especially <laughs> now, the days there's... There's so much and and we can control some of that. Like mm -hmm. you said, what are you putting on when you're when you're driving in the car? Mm -hmm. What are you putting on when you are cutting vegetables, you know, to prepare for dinner? And what are you looking at on your phone? Yeah. You know, I think a lot of that can be noise that we don't that we don't need that we we can turn down. Or that what we text can text threads are you responding to? That <laughs> exactly. all gets our energy and that mm -hmm. makes an incredible difference on our well being. It just does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. So this one's served right up for you. Mm -hmm. We know how the school year goes in waves, and there are those days or weeks that we struggle to survive. What is mm -hmm. something that every educator needs to hear in that moment to power up through that moment of struggle? So it's my, my mom's advice. So she would often tell us she knew the secret of life. And the secret of life is surround yourself with good people and love them well. Find your people. <laughs> Keep them close. There are going to be conflict entrepreneurs around us. There's going to be people who thrive on drama. Those are not our people. Find your people, become anchored to them, and know that on really great days when you have something to celebrate, go there. On really hard days when you have something to be upset about, go there. And make sure you just know who your people are. It's just the most important. We need a, a, a network of support at school, just like we do at home. And make sure they know that they are your anchor mm -hmm. if they are right. Yep. Make that I person... call my group, my net, we're each other's net and we all just take turns like moving the net, catching whoever's mm -hmm. falling. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so true. So it's easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom. What separates the teachers who are the ones constantly seeking to change, innovate and adopt new teaching strategies? I think they are again, to talk about being a reflective practitioner. And I think this is George Kuros who says, you know, would you want to be a student in your own room? Right. And to, it's much easier for us to just do the same thing every year, but our kids are not the same every year. And they, they deserve to have a teacher who is willing to modify, adjust and meet them where they are, not the students last year or five years ago, the students they have in front of them. They feel it. They know. I have, <laughs> I've often said, there's a lot that I didn't do fantastic as a teacher. There's a lot of things that I probably did that were wrong, but I think my greatest asset as a teacher that has helped me grow into being a coach is being reflective. Mm -hmm. I think that it is so important. It can be hard to do. It's sure. so easy to push that off. I was working with a new teacher this year that reached out to me with some concerns that he had about what he was seeing in his classroom. And I told him, I said, listen, if you can keep asking this question, for the rest of your career, you're going to be a fantastic teacher. The yeah. fact that you are taking the initiative and recognizing that on your own, yeah. it's just being reflective is so is so important to to see what you're doing on a daily basis and, and how you can just do 1% better the next day for, for your kids. So last question is easy. Oh, oh yes, Please. good. Okay, no, yes. Go, go, go ahead. No, I'll, I'll work it into the last answer. Go ahead. Okay. All right. <laughs> So how can our audience connect with you, follow along with you, um, and join the, join the, the, the daily, the, uh, the daily tribe. So everything is teach happier. So Instagram, the podcast is teach happier. The book is teach happier. What isn't called teach happier that I'm going to shoehorn into this answer is <laughs> that you could also find us. If you looked up the 2022, international cornhole champions of Akron, Ohio, <laughs> you could also find me there along with Ken because we were the cornhole champs. Thank you it's for very asking. True. It's very true. <laughs> you have to go back and listen to, uh, let me, let me pull up the show number just to make sure we get this yep, right. It was with Rob our, Dunlap, right? Our, Rob Dunlap, our yep. common friend mm -hmm. who you introduced me to. You know, he's listening to this to the end. So Rob, oh, yeah. here it is. Lest Absolutely. you forget. This was 
for our listeners show 141. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talk about beating Rob um, in that <laughs> international composition uh, competition right. as he is yeah. he is from Canada. And so, so I actually wanted to, this will allow me to weave in something I want to say. I just want to thank you very much, Suzanne, for being here. Um, I knew who you were three years ago, but we honestly had, even though we lived never, in districts right. right next to each other, our paths never formally crossed. We even have my, my former principal worked with you, my childhood principal who became a mentor to me in education was your boss, Mr. Schwartz. So we had so many common acquaintances, but we never really formally met until we, until we met at the teach better conference last year. And you've become a, a very good friend of mine. And I, I appreciate everything that you do for me. You, you do a lot of things to, to help me and support me. And I think it's so important for educators, for students, for people to have good people to follow and listen and to, to learn from, and you are just genuinely a very good person. And Thank I you, think Ken. that's why you are so successful because your book speaks to that. Your podcast speaks to that. When you interact, when you interact with teachers, it speaks to that. You are a genuine good person. That's why your kids loved you. That's why they're, <laughs> that's why they're inviting you to baby showers. I know. And you know, that's why, that's why teachers have trusted you for so long in your district, because you are just a good person. And I want you to make sure you keep doing that. Don't get your admin, sir. You're right where you need to be. <laughs> thank you, Ken. And now I know exactly what's going in my gratitude book tonight. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, to our listeners, thank you for joining the conversation. Uh, Suzanne, thank you again for coming on the show with us. Matt, I'm sorry we missed you. Suzanne is not happy with you Matt. at all. <laughs> As we power down this episode, Suzanne, you have definitely left us feeling powered up. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to or watching us on YouTube. Each week we get to talk to amazing educators who are making a positive impact on the lives of students, their colleagues, administrators, and education as a whole. It's been such a privilege every week to be able to talk to these incredible individuals, learn from them, grow with them, and better myself and all of education through these conversations. If you haven't already, please consider sharing this with a colleague, someone who can benefit and be powered up from the experience of listening to these incredible conversations. Because of Powered Up, we are powering education by empowering you.